Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to get started here. Come on down. The price is right. The pesticide credits are coming in. One, two. She comes to here. It's more fun. <laughs> Hi, this is Gerald Ellers again. Uh, I probably won't have to inform you any more of what uh, is going on in the meeting, and I probably don't. Ha they won't give me enough time to tell you a joke. So you have a good di day, program, and I hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs> that was a shout out the crosser. Yeah, that was for Prosser. All right, let's introduce Gwen Ho Heisel, talking about the power of air to affect spray coverage in blueberries. She traveled all the way from Prosser, and uh, I understand she got stuck at the pass. So uh, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm the last talk of the day. I get that, and uh, but still worth the pesticide credit, which is good. So um, I work primarily in fruit crops. So I'm in tree fruit, grapes, and blueberries. So, uh, and then within that, I was trained as an entomologist. So um, a decade or so ago, I got into sprayers. So this is the first time I've talked to you all in Linden. Um, there's a whole Prosser group that is looked is watching through that little video camera. So normally I'm in Prosser watching all of you all. Right, but we have someone else doing that today, so it's working out well. Um, so when I give my talk, you're gonna see a lot of pictures that are from all of those crops. So don't let it spook you that you might see a tree instead of a bush, but a lot of the topics or the concepts apply to all of those crops. And since I work in all of them, and my greatest efficiency is to take pictures while I'm doing things, then I borrow from people. So, and sometimes it's in different commodities that I get those pictures taken. Okay, so today our goal is basically to discuss why we should have um, air match the shape of our canopy and the size or density of our canopy. Um, I want to show you how to assess and control your air on your sprayers. And I want to inspire you because it is now officially December, I was almost said November, it's December. You have from December, January, and February, and then you're gonna probably start in March, some of you to get out spraying. So you have several months to come up with your plan, think about it, and I'm hoping that you are inspired to want to go look at your sprayers between now and then. Um, okay, oh, the other thing is, is that I'm doing a workshop tomorrow, which is one of the reasons I came over. So we went from 27 people to 45 people overnight, right? So maybe you're inspired to come see me tomorrow too. You can decide if you already signed up whether you wanna to come tomorrow. Um, okay, so the assumptions before I talk about um, what I think of as optimizing your sprayers. Um, and when I talk through this, I'll give you these assumptions that there's no perfect machine. So when I describe a person's machine um, or I look at some of these that are out at the trade show. There's some that are good. They have good features. They have bad features. You can make any sprayer work and work well, right? And you can take a new sprayer and you can really screw it up, right? 
So it really depends on your management and how much you're paying attention, right? So um, as I go through things, don't think I'm endorsing one machine or not. Okay, so with any spray that you put on, my mantra is that you really want every drop to the crop. You can think about that when you're in your tractor. Oh yeah, we're getting every drop to the crop. But deposition, which is basically the amount of material that you put on a canopy, has three things that affect it, right? So you tell me what are those three things. Prosser, I know you already know them. So give me one. What are three things that affect how much you're putting out on your crop? What? Pressure is one, right? Pressure. Okay, yep. But how much volume of water is determined by what? Size of the nozzles. So pressures, nozzles, and forward speed, right? So if you change any of those, tomorrow I'll put this in a triangle, like your disease triangle. This is your deposition triangle, right? So if you change any one of those on your sprayer, you're going to drastically affect what your deposition is, how much is coming out, right? So what we need to assume first on all the rest of this presentation is that the maintenance and proper operation of your machine is being done, right? Because this is not a talk on how to calibrate your sprayer. We can go over some of that tomorrow. This is how to perfect your sprayer. This is about how to optimize your air and volume and direction. So if you do not have all of the things working properly, do that first and then go to the optimizing of the air. Okay, so what I'm talking about on maintenance is if you do not have a program set up to look at the best management practices of your hoses, are your tires being looked at? Is your pressure gauge being changed annually? Do you have nozzles um, that are worn or clogged? How often do you look at them? Do you look at them once and assume they're done throughout the season? How often, right? They will get clogged if you never look at them again throughout the season. Um, have you considered the proper nozzle droplet sizes? Do you have a plan where you're looking at your filters throughout the season? When you, if you're using a rate controller, um, is it programmed correctly? Um, do you, or have you looked at what your proper speed is? Do you really know you're driving three miles an hour? Are you spraying in wind? Have you trained your people? Have you empowered them with the tools to know how to operate your sprayer? When you put chemicals into the tank, are you measuring that your water is neutral, right? Because the pH of your water affects the um, half-life or efficacy of your chemical, and have you mixed and load properly, right? Sometimes when I go look at things, they say, see, this thing isn't working. And I kind of think that sometimes the chemical was forgotten to put in, right? So these are all things we're not gonna talk about. I'm gonna assume that you all have a plan to look at this. And if you have questions about any of those things I covered, that's what we'll talk about tomorrow, all right? So this is a good picture um, that was from Oregon, actually, right? So look at the little drift clouds. You see those little puffs of cloud in the air? So I think there's, I think I learned from yesterday. So you see them here, here, here. This is a great shot of nature, isn't it? With the little drift puff clouds going up in the air. So I don't look at those all the time as drift clouds, and you shouldn't either. What you should really be looking at them as is money. You are paying for someone to drive through, so you're paying their salary to put the chemical on, and you just paid a lot of money. When you look every winter at your chemical bill, you can tell me how much of that chemical bill hit your crop and how much poofed into the air and drifted off. So if you don't like the word drift, you might like the word money, right? So when I look at this as optimization and why you should be worried about it or consider it, it's because it's money back into your pocket. It's part of your production costs. Okay. So air is a key component. And if we optimize the air, right, then we have real control of our sprayers. So 
To optimize the air, the goal is really to increase the spray on the target and reduce drift. And the two happen hand on hand. If you put more on the crop, then you've reduced the drift. Okay, so the purpose of air is basically to move the droplets from the machine to the target, right? This is an old picture from an old air blast, a WSU extension publication, actually. When air blast came long ago, this is what we were to do, blast that up into the trees, right? But air flow controls where you place the droplet. So wherever air goes, that's where your pesticides go, right? So if we can monitor it, then we know what's happening. So I'm gonna give you two examples of a research study that was funded by Oregon um, Blueberry Commission. And um, it's a great example of two machines that have extreme differences in air. So this is an electrostatic sprayer. You guys ever seen an on-target sprayer? Yeah. So this is an on-target sprayer. It is um, very low air generally. And um, we, it's meant to drive, here's the laser pointer. So these are blueberries. It's meant to drive up one row and it turns around and comes back and does the other side, right? So they have different makes, models. This isn't so much about the machine, but about the air. So then what we did in this study is we measured the air speed at the front of the canopy, the middle of the canopy, and the back side of the canopy. So we go from three, one to 0.5 miles per hour, right? Then what we also did is we had drift poles. So we had poles that were um, stuck up in the one, two, and three rows over to collect how much spray drifted within a field, right? What we were really targeting is for all the spray to go right within that row. What you can see, we spray with a dye, then we go into the lab and we collect it, we measure the dye, we do a bunch of stuff for two weeks, play loud music, have a good time, and then we come out with a number, right? And I look at the relative numbers. So we have about 100 nanograms per centimeter squared, right? So we have about 100 amounts of deposition when you're one, two, and three rows over, and you're at 50 by the time you're three rows over. That's a pretty little amount. So then you have a different sprayer, which we have in the trade show here. And it's a good sprayer too. And like any other sprayers, you can remember, operate them poorly, operate them great. The aspect of this sprayer that they tell you is that it is meant, it's cannon sprayer, and it is meant to have a high velocity of air because they want you or was developed so that you can drive around the perimeter of your field if you've planted your blueberries too close. When you go through and you knock the blueberries off because the plant or the machine is hitting it, so you're driving around the perimeter. So this machine can spray 10 rows at a time. It just goes, shoots it all the way across. When we did our study, we had it spray three rows, right? So we calibrated it to do that. And because it's only supposed to spray the perimeter, we drove it up and then it sprayed across three rows. And again, we set up drift poles and we took the speed of air and it was six miles per hour, 21 miles an hour, which was certainly fun to stand there and measure that, four miles an hour. And then it only got down to one or almost nothing by the time you were one row over. So remember the one before, we were almost at zero by the time we were at the end of our target, but we're still at four here. The difference is, huge in how much field of drift you have. Because your air is big, you've moved your spray beyond where you want it to be, right? So, but the thing is, this machine is doing what it's supposed to do, but that's the power of air. You need to have the appropriate amount of air targeted for where you want or what your goal um, and canopy size is to spray. So here we're at five times, two times, or four times the amount of deposition, one, two, and three rows over. Um, but if you can't spray through the rows, maybe it's not too bad. So if you miss the target, you basically have waste of pesticide cost, you're not controlling the pest, you have more cold, and you increase resistance, right? So let's look at how does air respond to the target size. So you have uh, a big, blueberries are small, but you have a relatively big bush that you're targeting, right? 
think about it as a difference. And I work in also apples where you have a skinny little, a lot of times on trellises, you have skinny little canopies and um, big apples. This, you have still a big bush that you're trying to get through. And air responds to target sizes and this affects it's not new. I didn't have to do any research. I didn't have to find any grant money. This is old. There's a topic of science called the fundamentals of boundary layers. Boundary layers are just there. It's what controls airplanes and everything else. I'm not making it up. But you can study it through a bunch of equations, but it's way more fun to look at it through my truck, right? So this is my pickup truck. And once you're in sprayer world, as long as I've been in, I look at the world a little differently. So I came out and it was a nice fall day and I'm like, that's awesome. Look at that boundary layer around my truck. So this is a good extension picture. <laughs> so my truck is a big object, right? Big objects have big boundary layers of air around them. The boundary layer is almost like a wall that the air can't get through. So the bigger the object, the larger the amount of boundary layer, and you see how the leaves have formed all the way around the truck. So this winter when it snows and you see drifts of snow, watch the boundary layers around things. You'll have bigger boundary layers around trash cans. You'll have smaller boundary layers around um, smaller objects, posts and stuff like that. Meaning you'll get snow that goes all the way around a post, but it will only go halfway around a tree or a garbage can, right? Just like my leaves here. So how does that relate to a spray? Okay, so this was an event we went out at night and you put some cool green dye in your sprayer and you decide to make your grapes glow, right? So then you can put a black light on them and you can see where the spray went. And the point of this is, is we had one speed that was going through and look at the larger objects of the cane here, right? So the larger the cane, the less green there is, and the skinnier canes have more green. And that's because of boundary layer. And so the larger the object you have, you need to slow down your airspeed so that you can penetrate around the boundary layer and get things to go onto your crop, okay? So I'm gonna give you one more example. And I have three cool videos to show you in this. And this is a video that I took, um, I think I have to get rid of the laser pointer to make it work. Okay, so this is a video I took um, in a lab that has a bubble machine, right? It's a big box and it blows bubbles up on one side, which is super cool. And then the bubbles come down in the box and you can see wherever bubbles go is where the air is flowing because these little bubbles are filled with helium and helium is a neutral gas. So if we had no air in here and I put a helium bubble, it would just stay still. Wherever air is moving, the helium bubble will follow. So another cool thing, if you get into sprays, you can play with bubbles. So the bubbles, for you to be able to see what's happening, the bubbles are these white streaks. See them, right? So what I want you to see in the beginning of this video is for like the first 15 seconds, we have the air up, high velocity air. And I want you to see, it's gonna come from this way, and I want you to see how few streaks there are on the back side of the apple. And about when I tell you, you're gonna see that we're gonna turn the air down, and I want you to see there's more swirl on the back side. Right, so we'll play it. Hopefully I have it on mute. Okay, so right now you do get some, right? But about now or so, we're starting to turn it down. And look, you're getting more constant swirls all in the back of your apple, much more regularly. It goes further down and down. Did you see it? So again, not a science I made up. This is the beginning. So less swirls in the back and more when you turn the air down. So the effective boundary layer is, is where we were taught always on our sprayers is this. Hey, it's late season. Turn that air up, right? We need to turn the, the fans on high because we got to penetrate through the canopy. And what I'm challenging you with through this 
is that we might not have canopy that is meant for the size of the fans that air blast sprayers were originally built for, which were those big tall trees. And that we, when we turn up the fan, there is a little bit of a Goldilocks effect that we need to now consider that turning down the fan on smaller canopies, and blueberries would be considered a smaller canopy as opposed to a 30 foot old growth apple or cherry tree, right? Or almonds that are still sprayed with those. So when you have that and you're blasting through with a high speed fan, it may not be penetrating all the way through and on the back and swirling into the blueberry canopy as you want it, right? And what's really nice is I just had a nice conversation with the Jacto manufacturers and they said, there's more to air than just, you know, where it's going. And they had the same thing. He said, what about boundary layers? We're going to talk about that. So even your manufacturers are out there thinking about boundary layers, right? So turn it down some. Okay, so how do you monitor air? We have fancy machines, but how you can do it. Do you guys have handheld weather stations? Yes, you do, because Tom Hoffman is in here and he is going to say when you have pesticide records, you are supposed to measure the airspeed. And you are not supposed to measure it from the weather station down the road. You are supposed to measure it from your handheld weather station, right? So that you're on farm and do it on the corner. So that these weather stations are cheap. Get them from Amazon. Give it to a friend for Christmas this year. Um, but they have, um, buy one that has an average unit on it, so they have an average option. They're 100 bucks, 150 bucks, cheap. It can, um, we put them up in the canopy. It'll tell you temperature, humidity, wind speed, et cetera, right? It's awesome. Um, we measure it at the opposite side of the canopy, measure it one row over. If your airspeed is five miles an hour, one row over, that means that you've blown through the canopy that you wanted, and now you're depositing under the center ground. Remember my pictures on the, on the blueberry where we had lots of deposition in the center rows? So you've put half of your product in the center rows because you have too much air. You want at the beginning of the canopy to have some air, the middle of the canopy less. By the time you're at the end of your one target row or three target rows if you're using a jack toe or something like that, you want to have minimal amount of air, right? And you know that, you can measure it, you can test it, you can change things by using a little machine like this, okay? Okay, so this is a video, don't worry, Betsy and I, it looks funky now, but Betsy and I have it good when it plays. So <laughs> this is what, this video, I'm gonna press play so you can see it and then I'm gonna pause it again. Okay, so this is, one that I've only gotten pictures taken in trees, but we've done it in blueberries, but I'm again lacking on the video concept. So one other way for you to determine, say, say you're just, you say 150 bucks is too much for me, man. We can't do that. So everybody has flagging at their farm. And if you have flagging, you can stick flagging on the opposite side of your canopy. So the sprayer is this green sprayer, oops. I don't know, if, well, I can't put the pointer, but you, hopefully you can see my um, hand. Um, this is the green sprayer over here. So it's going to spray into here, and on the opposite side, you're going to tie blue flagging. And if the ribbon flows straight out, you have too much air. If it flutters, you have about the proper amount of air, and if it doesn't move at all, you don't have enough air. So my first recommendation is spend the money and get a weather station because you need it for pesticide records anyway. My second cheapo method is put up the flagging, right? So now you can see how it happens. So watch where the arrow is. There's blue ribbon here. And when it sprays, you'll see it spray straight out because it's dormant season. They're going to blow straight out, right? But that would be too much air for dormant season because that means that the air that has the pesticide droplets has grown through your canopy and like a bullet, when it lands as a trajectory, it's going to land in this mid-row, which is all wasted chemical for you. Okay, so besides just controlling that air volume, we also have air direction. And I put here a tree crop, but also a blueberry crop, because I want to make the point it doesn't matter what crop you're on or how diversified you are. If you have blueberries, trees, grapes, corn, whatever, 
right? You need to point the air and the nozzles into the canopy. And it, it sounds so simple, but it's not something everybody looks at every single time, right? And even when we have some nice, I'm working with a very good um, cooperator and they have really nice over the row machines, the nice air, uh, nice fan heads like this, and the fan heads come a little loose and I go up to them and I'm like, man, one of them's pointed this way instead of up into the canopy and the other one's pointed straight up because they wiggled and they moved loose during the spray and nobody paid attention to say at the end of every tank, somebody should get out, go look, are the heads still pointed into the canopy? Because they got whacked by a branch or moved through or something. Something so simple like that the rest of the spray, they're spraying into the air and down on the ground. So um, this Jackdo, they have kind of an interesting thing where they have a big cannon that sprays. It should be aimed to spray your 10 rows out. And then they have these little nozzles that should be aimed to spray into that first row as it comes through, right? So again, even with air shear nozzles, you're aiming them into the canopy. Okay. So controlling the direction of air. So when any fan spins, it doesn't matter if it's on a big air blast sprayer, it doesn't matter if it's on um, one of these machines where you have smaller fans and multi-headed sprayers. When it spins, it um, has, provides an um, ununiform um, movement of air. So as the fan spins, it pushes air down on the side that it's going, and then it pushes air up on the other side, right? So this is just a concept. Again, I'm not making it up. It just comes down on the side, and if it spins the other way, it goes the other way, right? So change and reverse it. If it's spinning counterclockwise, then you'd be spinning up on this side and down on the other, because some air blasts spin the other way. But what happens with that, and you can see it when you, um, uh, when you tie flagging onto your sprayer, but what happens with that is that you hit the ground on the right side and you miss the bottom canopy on the left side. And so then what they do is, have you ever seen these sprayers where they put these little deflectors on them, right? So people always make them look symmetrical, which I think is great. Yeah, you put them out there and you put it symmetrical, but that makes no sense. They should look goofy, right? Because it should be up, on this side, it should be pointed up on the side where the, um, so that it can allow for as much air to move up and it should be pointed further down on the side where the air is coming up. So it should look almost more like at a right angle or what is that, like 60 degrees. It should never look like a V straight on because it's not compensating for the fact that air changes when you're rotating a fan. Right, but most of the time we've pulled these off, right? And they put on these little dinky ones that are like, you know, four inches big. And then what do we get, Tom? We got that one that came from a sprayer, brand new from the manufacturer, and they put them on upside down. So here's my recommendation. If you're gonna use deflectors, get ones that are big and long because you have a lot of air coming out of that sprayer. So you can't put something on that's four feet long or four inches long and expect it to deflect anything. And then make sure that the tunnel, see it's inverted as a tunnel, and you can see it on the bottom here. These sometimes get mounted um, backwards. So the tunnel is really what's, what's moving that air. So this is the rich man method, which probably cost you a couple hundred bucks. The poor man method is to use flagging, right? So with flagging, you can put um, tie flagging onto every other nozzle, and you can see the discrepancy of what is where your air is moving based on your fan rotation. And then at the same time, you can turn nozzles off. You can see if there's spray coming up here on this, we've missed our target. So perhaps don't turn that nozzle on because you've missed that target. Because wherever the air is going, that's where the spray is going. So on this one, you can see that there's blue ribbon and it's hitting the top of the target. So leave these nozzles on. Turn those off. Make sense? 
this sprayer has no deflector. So there's nothing you can do to change it other than to change where, where your nozzles are pointed and which nozzles are on and off, right? Okay, so here's another one. So I um, have spent some time going to other countries because I often hear Europe is ahead of us in some of their technologies, right? Someone told me that there's an awesome um, trade show right across in Canada that has pretty cool European machines. Maybe I'll go to in January. But this is a machine um, that I wanted to show as an example because now we've talked about um, direction and um, uh, air volume as we go forward, but how are we gonna control air volume? And this isn't available on all our machines, but it's coming, right? Because it is in Europe. And our manufacturers here know about it. It's just that we don't have it on our machines yet. And I like to show it because I like to show you the possibility of automation. So this would be a rich man's method. Then you get the next slide, which is our poor man's method. So watch, there's a little louver here. And it, um, it's open right now, so it's max amount of air. So look at the leaves. Now that'd be minimal amount of air. And it'll open it back up, max amount of air. So this is done by a flip of the switch, just like you would turn your nozzles on and off. It's a flip of the switch inside the canopy. We need to get to the point that we are demanding this from our sprayers. Because as we go from block to block with different canopies, different densities, different architects, different crops, right? We have to be, we're diversified. We need something as easy as this to be able to control air, right? I know that none of the machines out here at the trade show do this. So you have poor man's method, which is a bunch of plywood, right? So if you have an air blast sprayer that's like a good old Rears air blast sprayer, and it um, has got really sturdy metal fan blades, then you can do this technique. We call it a plywood donut. There's an ag engineer out of Cornell. Um, he was the one that first started working with it. And then we've looked at it. Uh, anecdotally throughout Washington and Oregon to say how much does it reduce so all you're doing is you're taking a ply piece of plywood and you trace it around the outside of your fan so you take the fan cage off you make you trace it you put holes in it and then you put it through the bolts and put the fan cage back on right one grower in New York he got kind of clever he drilled a bunch of holes so that through the year he could make some more open some less open he got you know, some, there's one grower in Oregon who has different size donuts, depending on what time of year. But as you go through, you put it on. What that does is it constricts the amount of air coming into an air blast, which means that you have less volume of air coming out, right? So there is a little bit of question. If you have the choice on an air blast to buy a smaller fan blade, you should do that first, right? If you have, there's um, some um, sprayers out here that have plastic fan blades, you'll bend them and torque them with this. So don't do that. Rears is a tank, so you can do it. There is still some question by some ag engineers, how long can you do this, right? Will it reduce the, the longevity of the machine? And I haven't broken one yet, but whoever breaks one first, let me know, right? So. If you have the option, get the smaller fan blade first, and then if not, reduce it by getting the plywood donut and demand the poor option or the rich man's option eventually that we have a louver system. So another option to control your air, gear up and throttle down. So what's that mean? You gear up the tractor and you throttle it down so your RPMs will go down, right? So you might be, instead of 540, you might be at 540E or even at four, you know, 500. So you've throttled it down, which makes the fan go slower. When the fan goes slower, you're sucking in less air, which means you have less volume of air going out. It's an awesome way. There is so many studies from the 70s. You know, they promote a gear up throttle down because it also saved money on gas. So during the gas crisis, they try to get all the farmers in California to gear up, throttle down, because you could save money on fuel. But the only problem with it, as you probably know it better than I do, is your terrain. Because what happens? 
you lose power. So it's hard on hills. So depending on what your farm looks like is how good, what? You would change your calibration a bit with it. So you, but gear up, if you can get yourself to throttle down and get yourself to work, you don't need a donut. All you've done is change your tractor settings, right? Maintain the same speed. Okay, so there are some options for wind. Then I wanna to talk to you guys, the other thing about air is a lot of these, what I think, we call them new sprayers, but they're not really new because they've been around for a long time. We just haven't adopted them, right? But just like what I just talked to you about that, um, I wanted to cover some ideas with it because that uh, electrostatic, the on target, has a very low airspeed, which is probably pretty good for the size of a blueberry canopy, right? Um, we're gonna talk about where is the air going and the pros and the cons of it, okay? This axial fans we talked about, as it spins, use deflectors, right? We also have air if it's a lateral flow, right? So now we have sprayers. We have a, tomorrow, I know that we have a little air blast sprayer where it has a mini tower on it. And I'm sorry, I was coming to try to see if I could get all the pictures and insert it and stuff, but past closed and I didn't get on my, I wasn't here as early as I wanted to be. So you get the tree picture. But on the air blast sprayer we have out there that's specific for your blueberries, it's a mini tower. So it looks like this turbo mist where it's got air coming in the back, but the tower is this big. It's the same concept. Inside your air blast, it's being pushed up through the veins, and then the air is going out laterally. That's a lot better because then the air coming up and out, right? Doesn't mean an air blast is bad because an air blast can go from many different canopy shapes and sizes and is diverse that way, but you have to tweak it for each one of those. So where you have machines that laterally flow, it will target into your canopy better. Um, this is a machine. You have several machines out there where you can direct the care, can, uh, air into the canopy. There's some out here that look more like boom sprayers as they come down. And again, they're directing that air in, but you better make sure that the nozzles or the heads are actually pointed up and into the canopy. Okay, so multiple fans will have an effect on different air patterns. So you have a um, couple of them out here and there's a Chima or Gearmore out here too. Remember how I said the axial fans will here will have um, a rotation effect where it's uneven? Well, when you stack them here to here or here to here, what happens is, is you push air down, right? And you're pushing air up so you end up with a streaking pattern in between them. Or if you're here, you can push air down and you can push air up, but they're spaced far enough apart that we actually see that that streaking pattern doesn't happen. So a way, if you have a machine that has heads that are very close together, one way to get around the banding streaking pattern from just the way the air is moving is to move the machines further away from the canopy, right? or move your heads further apart. Okay, so let's look about some sprayer types, right, as they relate to air. Air blast sprayers, I actually like them to some extent. They're easy to clean, they're easy to adjust. Man, I can tell you exactly, if I change that air, I can tell you where the air is gonna go. I can do it cheap man's method with some flagging and a piece of stick, and I know what's happening. If I change the flow rate on a nozzle and I want more at the top and less at the bottom, that's easy. I just change out my nozzles, right? It's not as easy on some other sprayers. And it's robust. It's a tank. So you have out there a Chima um, or a Gearmore that has air shear nozzles. And how those nozzles work is they have, um, it's a complete different mindset on air now than everything I just told you. So that's why I'm gonna make sure we cover it. So air shear versus standard disc core are all the things I just told you. But the air shear is where you have a, a stream of water and then air comes into the stream and breaks up the water 
and creates lots of droplets. If you throttle down on an air shear, then what you've done is you've decreased that air volume, you get slob, you get this like slobbering effect, you don't get little fine droplets like you wanted, right? So if you have an air shear sprayer, the best advice I can give you for your blueberries is try to find a sprayer that starts out already with the lowest volume of air as possible. Right? because you don't have, you might think your canopies are dense and big, but they're not that far from the sprayer and they're really not that dense, right? Because you can't do some of the other things that we just talked about. Um, okay, electrostatic nozzles and sprayers generally tend, even that electroblast that's out there, it generally has a very low airspeed on their sprayers um, and the on targets have a low airspeed on them. What's nice about them is that there's nothing to change as far as nozzles go. Um, they do have very fine droplets of the order of 50 microns. Smaller droplets will drift more, but they also get better coverage. Um, but it's not no powders, but things can clog those machines a little bit more than um, something with a larger nozzle size. But even the manufacturers have told me, if you're gonna be a slob with my sprayer, this isn't the sprayer for you, right? So I know that in the Canada show, there have been tunnel sprayers that have been um, demonstrated and you don't have a single tunnel sprayer here. So that's the ultimate in air control. Like that's really exciting because you have a tunnel that is blocking any wind coming from, unless the wind is going through the tunnel, right? But any wind that may be coming through, plus all the air that you're going is getting blocked within that tunnel. And so you don't really need to change, tweak, play with, adjust your air volume of your sprayer because it's going into the tunnel sprayer, right? It's even better than the opposing forces and the direction coming into the canopy because there's a wall on each side to block any excess air. But we don't have, not a single one out here. Brad used to, and I see you back there, Brad used to be a distributor for um, a Bertoni, um, but I don't even think they're sold in the state of Washington anymore, right? But I do know there's some tunnels in Canada. Okay, so in summary, right, in order to optimize the airflow, um, all other parts must be functioning well. So if you have any questions about those things I said, your pressure gauges, your nozzles, your filters, how to do them, that's for tomorrow, right? Um, air controls where we put or don't put the droplets. If you blow air through your canopy and your air is at a high speed at the backside of your canopy, that means you put your spray, your money, your dollars onto the mid row, not onto your canopy. The speed and volume of the air should be adjusted in the season to account for boundary layers and for the canopy as it grows. Um, and there's cheap, easy ways to monitor and control air, right? So I try to give you poor man, rich man method. Okay, so then the last one is stay informed. So I'm gonna give you some resources. There's a great website called sprayers101.com. I did not create this website, but there's an awesome ag engineer out of Canada. And Jason DeVoe puts up all kinds of good stuff on that website. There is a book, um, it's not for blueberries, but it has a lot of good information. There's one called Effective Vineyard Spraying, and it has information. The reason I put it up there is because a lot of this stuff about how does a pump work and what about your pressure gauges and what about your air, it's going to be the same that the sprayer, these sprayers get used on different commodities. So even though the word vineyard's in there, it's still a good book. Um, we do with Department of Ag, um, Washington State Department of Ag and WSU offers calibration and optimization courses. So um, what you get tomorrow is a really condensed, what we do in eight hours, you're going to get in four hours, right? So we'll go till your head spins tomorrow. Um, but they're one day classes. So look on the Department of Ag website. They're worth a lot of credits, like almost all your credits in one day for the year, right? And then if you're not signed up yet, WSU Irrigation, it's a 
touchy, it's a touch screen. So WSU Irrigated Ag um, is what I run out of Prosser. Chris has got his stuff also, but especially for you Prosser people, um, irrigatedag.wsu.edu, and we send out emails that um, are good announcements. You can sign up for anything you want, blueberries, cherries, I don't know, goats, go on cows, anything you use water for, right? Okay, questions? Thanks, Glenn. Yep. Daryl? Daryl, yes! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Didn't want to let you down. Uh, so this is more of an observation. On my wind blast, uh, I use cone sprayers. Uh, forward and back. Uh, I noticed that when with my wind blast uh, that mainly if you don't have a lot of foliage the suction of the fan when the, the, the chem chemical blows out I see it turning back into me and being sucked back in to go back out again. Uh, a lot of times I'll go and I'll spray up wind so that way if I do have because to try and get the top of the plant let a little bit of this drift go behind you as you move forward across the field. Yeah. Uh, so, but you should never rely, and tomorrow I'll show you, you should never rely on the swirl. You know, you stand back and some people will say the sprayer's going, they say, ah, I've stood there so many times, just like you do, and you say, wow, look at that good growth, ah. When you see the swirl coming out of the sprayer, the swirl moves and change, and we've collected where it goes, and it doesn't match the swirl, right? So where it goes doesn't always match that swirl pattern. But I think your concept of trying to adjust your spray, especially on border rows, especially when there's wind, that's a good concept. Nine mile an hour wind, which was a really cool demo we did, but nine mile an hour wind on a old growth apple tree, maybe about eight feet wide, so it's not that wide, but spraying with a full air blast rears that wind is not enough to get the back side. So if you have a tree, you're spraying here, it won't reach the back side if the wind is coming this way. It's just nine mile an hour is too much for it. So compensating, I understand you shouldn't spray in nine mile an hour, but I also understand you have to do what you have to do depending on the weather. So adjusting your spray is good. Uh, one thing I do is, is uh, with my wind blast, I only try to do two half rows. It'd be the same, you blow to the, the left and the right of the tractor, and I do every, every row. So when I come back the next row, as I do every row, then I'm blowing back in from the other side. Yeah, you're doing the every other row blow through method? Normally every row. Uh, but only uh, half less, of every row. Less, Unless, uh, like in raspberries, where you just got a few sticks, then, uh, uh, then, then, then it's kind of a different story. It, it, with blueberries, I do every row. So you do every row, but you only spray from one side, and then the next time you spray, you're spraying from the other side. So as long as you're getting good coverage, I can't debate that. There is a good study that looked at every other row spraying, and so they did that one, you sprayed every other row and every other time they sprayed the alternate rows, right? And it was great that it showed that by doing that, there was an awesome way you can serve the most beneficial insects. But the beneficial insects are eating something and they're eating the bad bugs that you don't want, that you have such a low tolerance for, that it is maybe not advised when we have such low thresholds for certain things, you know, like cherry fruit fly or SWD, things get rejected so much. Alan talked about that yesterday, your low thresholds for SWD. So, uh, but yours, you're spraying every row, you're just assuming you get good coverage on the backside. And if you are, and you've looked at it with water sensitive paper or something like that, then no objection. Uh, one thing I noticed, like when I've got leaves on my raspberries that, uh, I thought, well, what I'll do is that I'll spray every other row and then I'll come back and spray, uh, uh, spray, spray the row that I didn't get. The only thing I found was that sometimes because the weather changed on me, that I sprayed every other row, but I found out that I got, didn't get as good a control because I, I lowered the amount of concentration per acre that I was putting on. And so I kind of learned an easy lesson on that, that, that you just, 
you you try and, and, and in the time zone that you got to make sure that the berries are all sprayed solid. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for Gwen? Anyone? You'll be around for a little bit, Gwen, right? Yeah. yeah. Usually I get all the questions in the back yeah. anyway. <laughs> well, let's thank Gwen for making the trip over Hi, here. Hi, Prosser. And keep in mind, tomorrow there's a four-hour intensive course focused on calibration. Yeah. Highly recommend it. Uh, this concludes our traditional two-day schedule. Tomorrow there's a session on water and a, a water quantity, uh, an important uh, issue in this region, and the sprayer calibration workshop that was just mentioned. We hope to see you there. Please drop surveys and get pesticide credits over here. Everyone have a great night.